In 1882, the United States government passed a new law that would forever change the nature of immigration in America, the Chinese Exclusion Act. That's ahead this week on Footnoting History. Hi, and welcome to Footnoting History. My name is Nathan. If you've listened to the podcast for any length of time, you know I teach history at the college level, and one of the many classes I teach is world history. One thing you quickly realize when you teach world history is just how fundamental migration is to the human experience. So much of our cultural, economic, and intellectual evolution as a species has revolved around the basic phenomenon of movement across the globe. Over time, as our technological ability to move larger numbers of people across even greater distances has grown, the volume of human migration has also increased, particularly in the last 50 or 60 years. As we begin to feel more and more the effects of climate change, migration is going to play a significant role in our world for the rest of your life and mine. I think it's important then for us to look at the ways that human societies across history have responded to the phenomenon of migration. Today, I want to talk about just one of those responses, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And before we get started, I particularly want to mention here the research of several historians who've done some excellent work and on whom I will lean rather heavily in this episode. Uh, the first is Erica Lee, who holds an immigration history chair and is the director of the Immigration History Research Center at the University of Minnesota. Uh, she's written many books and articles on the experiences of Asians in general and Chinese immigrants specifically. I highly recommend her book, At America's Gates, Chinese Immigration During the Exclusion Era. And the second is Andrew Geary, whose book, Closing the Gate, Race, Politics, and the Chinese Exclusion Act, looks at the building of racial and labor rhetoric in the 19th century that was uh, the basis of the anti-Chinese movement in America. There are, however, many historians doing a lot of important work in this field, and as always, you can find a full bibliography for this episode, and all of our episodes, on our website, footnotinghistory.com. To understand the origins of the Exclusion Act, we have to go back to the beginning of the 19th century, and specifically, Chinese trade relations with European nations. The Qing government of China was, at the time, very wary of trade with Europe, and forced all maritime trade through one port at Guangzhou or Canton in southern China. Europe, however, was quite desperate to open extensive trading relations with China. Luxury goods, namely Chinese teas, porcelains, and silks, were in high demand back in Europe. For their part, the Europeans had very little that the Chinese seemed to be interested in acquiring. Uh, one exception here was silver, which had been in high demand since at least the Ming Dynasty. Uh, for more on that, you can check out my episode from last year on the silver mine at Potosi in Spanish America. At any rate, European governments tried desperately to get the Chinese government to increase the volume of trade. Most famously, the British government sent their first diplomatic mission to China in 1793 under the auspices of Earl George McCartney. This went poorly, and it ended with the Chinese emperor writing to the British monarch George III, he of American Revolution fame, that, quote, Our celestial empire possesses all things in prolific abundance, and lacks no product within its borders. There is therefore no need to import the manufacturers of outside barbarians in exchange for our own produce, end quote. Uh, the emperor's letter then goes on to point out that, if any special concessions were made to the British, other European nations would also demand those same concessions, so they're just not going to make them in the first place. To make a long story short, Britain and China eventually found themselves at war with one another in 1839. Uh, this is the first Opium War, so-called because the British did eventually discover something that sold well in China, highly addictive drugs. The war was sparked when the Chinese attempted to crack down on the opium trade, and to, again, make a long story short, the Chinese wound up losing this war and opening a whole host of ports and trade to Britain and the rest of Europe. By the mid-19th century, Europeans had established a firm toehold in China, not just economically, but also politically. Things gradually became ever worse for the Qing government as ecological and economic disasters piled up, uh, culminating in several civil uprisings, 
The most destructive of these, the 14-year-long Taiping Rebellion, which ended in 1864, resulted in the deaths of over 20 million Chinese. Given these conditions, it's perhaps little surprise that many Chinese, particularly in the South, begin to look for alternatives outside of China. Which brings us to America. Now, there had been a Chinese presence in the New World since at least the 16th century, particularly after the Spanish conquered the Philippines and established a trade center at Manila from which the aforementioned silver flowed from the mines in Mexico and Bolivia across the Pacific and then to China and the rest of Asia. Until the mid-19th century, however, most Chinese who crossed the Pacific wound up in Latin America and the Caribbean. During the decline and abolition of the slave trade, laborers from China and other countries were actively recruited to work on the profitable sugar plantations of the Caribbean. Uh, these overwhelmingly male laborers, uh, known as coolies, agreed to indenture contracts which guaranteed their labor for a certain number of years. Now, a word about that terminology. Uh, today, the word coolie is widely regarded as a derogatory racial slur for Asians in general and especially the Chinese. The word itself is of Indian origin, but the reason it becomes a racial slang term is largely because of the events that I'm going to be talking about today. In this context, the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, coolie meant someone who was a contract or indentured laborer. In the Caribbean, where they were much more common, especially in places like Cuba, these contract laborers were treated a little better than slaves. When large numbers of Chinese began immigrating to the United States, though, they were generally not contract or indentured laborers. But one of the frequent accusations against the Chinese community was that they were indentured and it was undermining the U.S. labor market. Speaking of the United States, uh, while there was some Chinese immigration to California in the first half of the 19th century, uh, California only became a state in 1850, the real influx began with the California Gold Rush in the late 1840s. Before the Gold Rush, only a few hundred Chinese immigrants, again largely male, were arriving each year. In 1852, the number of Chinese arrivals was just over 20,000, though that was a minority compared to the hundreds of thousands of people coming to California from the eastern United States. In addition to the mining industry, Chinese workers were also employed in the process of railroad expansion, particularly the construction of the first transcontinental railroad, which was completed in 1869. I should note that immigration into the U.S., again, was not generally contract or indentured labor, as had been the case in Latin America and the Caribbean. Here, instead, immigrants tended to take out interest-generating loans from family members or from brokers in something called the credit ticket system. Uh, these loans would then be repaid over the course of several years. By 1870, though, the position of Chinese immigrants in U.S. society was beginning to shift. The United States had participated in the Second Opium War against China alongside Great Britain and France, and to a lesser degree, Russia, in the 1850s, and in the 1860s, under Presidents Lincoln and Johnson, the diplomatic envoy to the Qing court was a man named Anson Burlingame. When Burlingame retired his American post in 1867, the Chinese government, whose respect and admiration he had earned, appointed him as their diplomatic envoy to the United States. The following year, in 1868, Burlingame negotiated a new treaty between the United States and China. This treaty, the Burlingame Seward Treaty, or just the Burlingame Treaty, uh, established a warm diplomatic relationship between the U.S. and China. With reference to immigration, it opened the door for increased numbers of Chinese to move to the U.S., but it expressly prevented those immigrants from naturalizing as U.S. citizens. Almost immediately after it was signed, certain forces within the U.S. political system sought to undermine and undo the Burlingame Treaty. One of the recurring critiques of U.S. immigration in the period, and especially in this case Chinese immigration, is that it undermined the native, meaning white, labor market. And some of the most significant opponents of Chinese immigration in the late 19th century were the forces of U.S. organized labor, who decried, wrongly, that overwhelming numbers of Chinese had come to the U.S. as contract laborers, and this threatened unions in the labor market. In the case of California, critics had long contended that Chinese laborers were willing to work for lower wages than white laborers, 
and had driven down the wage market first in mining and then in other occupations as the mining demands decreased and laborers in those occupations or in railway building were forced to find other work. But racist attitudes and limitations imposed on Chinese workers meant that many occupations were closed to them. And so the Chinese frequently undertook labor in sectors where American workers did not want to work, particularly in the laundry and restaurant industries. But even here, there was a catch-22, because in American culture, laundry and food service were traditionally gendered feminine occupations, and social critics decried these economic and gender activities. In a particularly racist 1902 essay entitled Meat vs. Rice, American Manhood vs. Asiatic Cooliism, Which Shall Survive, the president and founder of the American Federation of Labor, Samuel Gompers, and his co-author, Herman Gutstadt, write that the Chinese, quote, beginning with the most menial avocations, gradually invaded one industry after another, until they not merely took the places of our girls as domestics and cooks, the laundry from our poorer women, and subsequently the white steam laundries, but the places also of the men and boys as boot and shoe makers, cigar makers, bag makers, miners, farm laborers, brick makers, tailors, slipper makers, and numerous other occupations. In the ladies' furnishing line, they gained absolute control, displacing hundreds of our girls who would otherwise have found profitable employment. Whatever business or trade they entered was, and is yet, absolutely doomed for the white laborer, as competition is simply impossible." End quote. Gumpers and Gutstadt's critiques were not limited to just economic activity, though. Uh, theirs is also a critique of the morality and cultural inferiority, not just of the Chinese, but all East Asian peoples. Chinese men in particular were for them sex-driven drug addicts. Uh, the thing is that Gumpers and Gutstadt were articulating racial attitudes that were widely held and that already had a long life in America. In April of 1824, for example, a young Ralph Waldo Emerson, just a few weeks shy of his 21st birthday, wrote in a letter that the Chinese, quote, worship crockery gods, which in Europe and America our babies are wise enough to put in baby houses. The summit of their philosophy and science is how to make tea. Indeed, the light of Confucius goes out in translation into the language of Shakespeare and Bacon. The closer contemplation we condescend to bestow, the more disgustful is that booby nation. The Chinese empire employs precisely a mummy's reputation, that of having preserved to a hair for three or four thousand years the ugliest features in the world. Even miserable Africa can say, I have hewn the wood and drawn the water to promote the wealth and civilization of other lands. But China, reverend dullness, hoary idiot, all she can say at the convocation of nations must be, I made the tea." End quote. This racial infantilizing and dehumanizing, this othering, merged seamlessly with emerging pseudoscientific views on the supposed genetics of race, as well as the protectionist labor argumentation of the post-Civil War period. While certainly not everyone in the United States agreed with it, and these racist attitudes did have their detractors, the Reconstruction and post-Reconstruction era was for the United States a time of economic and social recovery, as well as social and racial tension. While they are separate issues, it is therefore perhaps unsurprising that the era which produced Jim Crow is the era which produced Chinese exclusion. Following the Berlin Game Treaty, one of the first planks of its dismantling came just seven years later in 1875 with the passage of the Page Act. While the U.S. government had previously passed restrictions on Chinese contract labor, the Page Act represents a specific targeting of the Asian countries and even more particularly bans immigration of women who were believed to be imported from China and Japan into the United States to serve as prostitutes. It also reiterated the prohibition of all indentured labor into the United States, as well as immigration by felons. Now, why Chinese women? Well, first, Chinese marriage and American marriage were very different institutions in this period, as polygamy and arranged marriage were common in China, but considered repugnant to American values. Moreover, the Chinese women who were sex workers, particularly in San Francisco, according to Ethna Levade, were accused of having spread venereal disease, leprosy, and syphilis to the white male population. This was then rhetorically coupled with concerns about the degradation of white families and family values. As a result of the Page Act, any Chinese woman traveling by herself to the United States could fall under suspicion of being a sex worker. 
therefore most female migration, which again was an overwhelming minority, could be subject to significant questioning. Four years after the passage of the Page Act, in 1879, there was another attempt to restrict Chinese immigration in the form of the 15 Passenger Bill. This would have restricted the number of Chinese passengers on any ship bound for a U.S. port to 15 in number. Though the act made it through Congress, it was vetoed by President Rutherford B. Hayes because it was in direct violation of the Burlingame Treaty. Now, given that Burlingame was clearly an obstacle, it is perhaps little surprise that the following year, 1880, Hayes's minister to China, James Burl Angel, uh, that's Angel with two L's, negotiated a modification of the Burlingame Treaty in what became known as the Angel Treaty. This treaty allowed the U.S. to restrict, though not ban, Chinese immigration. This restriction was limited to working-class laborers. Teachers, students, merchants, and tourists were still allowed to enter the U.S., and Chinese who were already in the U.S. were not restricted in their movements. The Angel Treaty laid out the basic groundwork for what would become, two years later, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. By the time of the Angel Treaty, the anti-Chinese labor movement which for many years had been confined to the Western United States, began to find traction in the East, and anti-Chinese political rhetoric became more and more prevalent. The Exclusion Act, though, was more targeted than some of the earlier legislation limiting Chinese immigration. First, the Page Act was more broadly targeted at all Asian women. The Exclusion Act only addressed Chinese immigrants, specifically Chinese working-class laborers, who were forbidden entry into the United States for a period of 10 years. If a Chinese person was already in the United States, upon leaving, the person had to obtain a certificate allowing him or her re-entry. As with the Angel Treaty, non-laboring Chinese were not barred from entry, but had to receive a certificate from the Chinese government stating that they were not a laborer and able to enter the U.S. In 1888, this was altered by the Scott Act, which said that no Chinese laborers who left the United States would be allowed re-entry. While the Exclusion Act was only supposed to be in place for 10 years, it was renewed in 1892 and made a permanent law in 1902. The Immigration Act of 1917 then imposed literacy requirements on all immigrants, and in the Immigration Act of 1924, the categories which were still allowed under the Exclusion Act were closed, and all Asian immigration was barred until 1943, though the law which ended Chinese exclusion, the Magnuson Act, imposed a maximum immigration quota of 105 Chinese persons per year. While the Exclusion Act built upon a decades-old foundation of immigration restriction law, particularly the Angel Treaty and the Page Act, previous laws had punished captains of ships carrying immigrants who, say, under the Page Act, could not enter the U.S. because they were suspected sex workers, but for the first time, the Exclusion Act made, as Erica Lee points out, illegal immigration a criminal act. Moreover, this was the most targeted restriction of immigration based on race, nationality, and class in U.S. history, and the precedent it set would become the basis for later immigration restrictions imposed on other national or ethnic groups from places like Mexico and South and Eastern Europe. Perhaps the most significant aspect of the act, though, is the administrative apparatus that was created in order to enforce it. Under the Exclusion Act, U.S. immigration law now required a direct and total monitoring of all immigrants entering the United States. In its wake, the entire bureaucracy of immigration control had to be expanded. As a means of exerting tighter enforcement of the Exclusion Act, the government opened the Angel Island Immigration Station in San Francisco Bay in 1910, a kind of western counterpart to Ellis Island in New York. Unlike Ellis Island, though, which was initially primarily for immigrant processing, Angel Island was both a processing and detention center. Uh, Ellis Island was eventually converted into an immigrant detention center in 1924. When Chinese immigrants arrived at Angel Island, they were subjected to medical exams as well as a barrage of questioning from immigration officials. These questions, which could routinely number in the hundreds for each immigrant, attempted to poke holes in their stories, an almost inquisitorial approach trying to find Chinese that were attempting to circumvent the exclusion regulations. Immigrants could be asked about minute details of their life back in China, 
the names of family members and neighbors, uh, important dates in family history, architectural and landscape details about their family homes, even down to the orientation of furniture in the house, as well as the various, again, social and familial relationships. If these did not coincide with other known details, or if two or more people were traveling together and their interrogations contradicted one another or did not line up in any way, this could be taken as evidence of duplicity and the individuals in question could be denied entry and deported back to China. Suspect cases were usually handled in a matter of weeks, but the longest detention at Angel Island lasted over two years. Additionally, the original 1882 law was pretty vague about a number of categories, such as individuals of mixed race. There was also the practical difficulty of enforcement. How were immigration controllers to know whether the person was working class or not? Some immigrants, so-called paper sons, were able to exploit these loopholes and secure documents which professed them to have a familial relationship that would enable them to meet the standards of the Exclusion Act. Other Chinese circumvented the strict West Coast policing by simply entering the U.S. through the much more permeable Canadian and Mexican borders. Uh, Canada would begin its own restrictions on Chinese immigration just three years after the U.S., and immigrants coming this way led to increased American policing of both Mexican and Canadian borders. To counteract these efforts, when the U.S. government renewed the Exclusion Act in 1892, it added the requirement that Chinese laborers already in the U.S. had to obtain and carry with them a certificate of residence, an early forerunner of what would eventually become the green card. If found without the certificate, the person would have to, quote, establish clearly to the satisfaction of a judge that by reason of accident, sickness, or other unavoidable cause, he has been unable to procure his certificate, and to the satisfaction of the court, and by at least one credible white witness, that he was a resident of the United States at the time of the passage of this act, end quote. Only Chinese immigrants were required to have these residency certificates. This restriction was not applied to other nationalities until 1928. The registration of immigrants relates to one of the broader social consequences of the Exclusion Act, which is the threat of deportation. Before the Page Act and the Exclusion Act, immigrants were rarely deported. Following the 1892 documentation requirement, theoretically any Chinese person could be questioned by immigration authorities and forced to prove their right to be within the borders of the United States. One side effect of this that Erica Lee points out is that Chinese ethnic enclaves became sources of suspicion and subject to regular raiding in the search for people without identification papers. These methods, developed to police Chinese immigration, were eventually applied to other ethnic groups in the 20th century. Life for Chinese immigrants both before and after the Exclusion Act was, needless to say, difficult. Despite the claims of their detractors that they were invading the country in swarms, between the onset of the gold rush in 1849 and the beginning of exclusion in 1882, only 258,000 Chinese had gained entry and Chinese made up just 4% of the total immigration to the United States in the decade before the Exclusion Act. In addition to the racism and discrimination that they faced in the States, they also faced the psychological toll of separation from their families and friends back in China, some of whom depended on them as a source of income. While it was sometimes possible to return to China and visit that family, the passage of the Scott Act in 1888 made that impossible for Chinese workers, and effectively stranded over 20,000 Chinese who were temporarily outside the United States at the time of its passage. The gender disparity in immigration, which was further exacerbated by the Page Act's extensive interview process for Chinese women, meant that single Chinese men who immigrated lacked a range of available marriage partners within their ethnic communities, but they also faced potential discrimination if they sought marriage partners outside their community. The creation of the ethnic enclaves of Chinatowns were therefore in many ways a coping and support mechanism to deal with the socioeconomic discrimination that immigrants faced. These communities were, as I've said, subject to government raiding, searching for unregistered Chinese, but in several Western states, Chinese communities were also the victims of mob violence. Nevertheless, despite these difficulties, people still sought to immigrate, and about 301,000 Chinese gained entry into the United States during the 60 years of exclusion.
While the Chinese Exclusion Act is a significant and important moment in the immigration history of the United States, there is a sense in which it is not unique. As I said at the top of the episode, the story of humanity is the story of migration. We move as a species, seeking out resources when ours become scarce, searching for opportunity when our societies become repressive, and hoping for a different hand than the one which we have been dealt. The racial and economic opposition to Chinese immigration was also not unique. From the ancient world to the modern one, immigrant groups are often demonized or dehumanized because they represent the different and the unfamiliar and a possible new competitor for resources. But there is a real sense that if you buy into a racist stereotype and deny the humanity of the immigrant, you're rejecting a fundamental part of what it means to be human. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. <laughs>